Welcome to our Energy Priorities Lunch and Learn. Momentum has been building around the issue of regulatory reform and competitive, competitiveness in our energy sector. Grassroots movements have taken hold in our country with citizens rallying and coming out in support of our oil and gas industry. Energy companies have organized and launched information campaigns and industry and business associations have mobilized their networks to influence provincial and federal governments. Sorry, I always forget I'm Sarah McKenzie, president of the Medicine <laughs> District Chamber of Commerce. Should not assume everybody knows me. <laughs> Recently, the Medicine Hat and District Chamber of Commerce joined with our chamber network across the country in a national day of action. Chambers raised their collective voice to emphasize the importance of creating a regulatory framework that allows our resources to be developed ethically, efficiently, and economically. We have asked for four actions. Get our energy resources to Tidewater without delay. We are pleased with the National Energy Board approval and we continue to advocate for recognition that the Trans Mountain Expansion Pipeline is in the national interest. Amend Bill C-69 to bring greater clarity, predictability and transparency to the law. Make immediate, regu make immediate regulatory changes promised in the fall economic update and the Premiers should make a broad mutual recognition of a recognition of each province's standards across all sectors and to do so in the short term. Our advocacy on this issue aligns with the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers' vision of enhancing Canada's prosperity by enabling responsible growth of Canada's upstream oil and natural gas industry. Today, you will hear about CAP's recommendations for strong growth in the oil and gas industry in Alberta increasing competitiveness in the global energy market and attracting investment back to the province. I'd like to now introduce Tim McMillan, President and CEO of the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, otherwise known as CAP. Tim is a Saskatchewan native who has a solid understanding of the oil and natural gas industry from both a business and landowner perspective. His education in economics combined with his experience in government holding strategic cabinet portfolios in the government of Saskatchewan allows him to understand the issues that are facing the industry today in a balanced and fair way. His role as CAP president and CEO, Tim advocates for economic competitiveness to enhance Canada's prosperity by enabling responsible growth of Canada's upstream oil and natural gas industry. Please help me in welcoming Tim. A pleasure to join you and a real opportunity to talk about some of the issues that we put forward in our Alberta oil and gas platform. And uh, as CAP, we have been very deliberate in, in what we think a positive future for our province looks like. And uh, that's really going to be the basis of what, uh, what I'm going to discuss today. And as you're putting forward the Chamber and your views and what your priorities are around energy, it really struck me with how truly aligned we are. So uh, having an opportunity to, um, is that giving feedback there? No. Um, so, um, in my role at CAP, I get a chance to talk to hundreds of people across the country. I get to engage with them about many things, and I'm always impressed with how all Canadians think about energy issues, and specifically how passionate people here in Alberta are. In recent weeks and months, we've seen Albertans stand up proudly for oil and gas. We've seen in communities across the province, people rallying, convoys, uh, getting on social media to support the energy sector. And it's truly inspiring to see the depth of support that we have. And we should be proud. Albertans have been in the business of innovating and developing our oil and gas resources for more than 100 years. And from those humble beginnings of the first oil well, to the modern day advances in horizontal drilling, bitumen recovery, and low carbon processes, Alberta Energy truly is a global leader. We took the oil sands from a science project to a national treasure. We unlocked the Montney and the Duvernay in the last 15 years. People flocked to Alberta to contribute their skills and their efforts. Hardworking, smart Canadians have found a welcoming home here in this province. We started to believe that our industry was unstoppable, that 
we could always succeed, that we could overcome any challenge, that we could solve any problem. We started to think that inefficiencies were not a worry, that foreign activists were just an annoyance, that the momentum, the inertia, was too great to ever truly be stopped. Sadly, we've come to learn that this isn't true, that we can take nothing for granted. CAP is a nonpartisan organization, and we view our role as to inform the discussion, to inform Albertans, to inform business leaders, to inform political leaders about the issues, the future, and the opportunity that we have. So today, I'm going to talk about why the energy industry matters so much to this province. I'm going to talk about our platform and the vision we put forward uh, for the province if we get the, the pieces right, and the recommendations to achieve that vision. And finally, why I'm confident that we're going to be able to achieve that energy future. All of us want to see our political leaders take real steps to get Alberta's economy back on track. But as somebody that spent several years in government and in cabinet, uh, my view of this is a little more complex than just hoping that uh, our elected leaders make those meaningful changes. I believe that democracy is more complex than that, that we as citizens have a very important role here as well, that we as citizens and business leaders need to give governments a mandate, a mandate to make those changes. We then need our political leaders to give us a clear commitment to increase the competitiveness of our energy sector. And I think that our North Star as Albertans should be nothing less than to make this province the most attractive place in the world for oil and natural gas investment. So let me start off with why does this matter? Uh, well, simply, the energy sector, oil and gas, are the backbone of the Alberta economy. A full one-third of all economic activity in Alberta is derived from the energy sector. It creates thousands of jobs across the province, and many of them right here in Medicine Hat. It delivers taxes and royalties to pay for schools, hospitals, roads, social programs. It's the basis of our very quality of life. If we look around, we can see the benefits almost everywhere. When the energy sector is succeeding, our hotels are full, our, our restaurants are busy, our housing markets are strong. It's clear that a strong energy sector in Alberta makes for a strong Alberta. And right now, our industry is hurting. Albertans are feeling the pain. Albertans are worried and frustrated. And I think that frustration is justified. We're in debt as a province. Unemployment is unacceptably high. And bankruptcies are all too common. And the energy sector can no longer contribute in the way that we once did. But I think there's hope, substantial hope, that we're a remarkably resilient people. And even in these tough times, this province has great potential. And that potential remains just within reach. That if we look around globally, demand for oil and gas continues to rise rapidly. That investment globally in oil and gas continues to rise rapidly as well. And anybody that tells us differently is wrong or they're lying. In fact, the International Energy Agency, they put out their forecast to 2040. And in every year between now and the end of their forecast, oil and gas demand grows. And in fact, by 2040, over 50% of all energy demand in the world will come from just oil and gas, the two commodities that we have in spades. It'll make up more than wind, solar, coal, nuclear, hydro, biomass combined, just from oil and gas. And here in Canada, and specifically in Alberta, we have substantial resources of both. And our ace in the hole is that we have a sophisticated and mature workforce that knows how to produce it efficiently and responsibly, given the chance. And that's where our platform and our vision is rooted. Our vision has Alberta doubling its capital investment in the energy sector in the next few years. That's an ambitious goal. But if we look back just to 2014, we had twice the capital investment that we do today. So we think that it's achievable. We think with that increased investment, 
we can double the global growth rate of both oil and gas, ultimately surpassing Iraq and China to become the world's fourth largest oil producer, and surpassing Iran and Qatar to become the world's third largest natural gas producer. Now I hope that all Canadians can get behind this vision of growth, and I certainly hope that all Albertans can. And that leads us to the recommendations to how do we achieve that? What are our recommendations to a newly elected government? The first is market access. Second is we need an efficient regulatory system. The third is we need the right economic conditions to attract investment. And finally, the fourth is the right climate policies. And I'd like to discuss each of these in a little more detail. Starting with market access. You know, it's apparent that we've been victims of a well-organized, foreign-funded campaign to limit investment in Canadian energy sector, in pipelines, in LNG facilities, to truly limit Canada's ability to compete globally. Thank you, Neil Young. Thank you, Sapporo Berman. You've cost us tens of thousands of jobs. We've been selling our resources at steep discounts with devastating consequences. In late 2018, it was costing us between 30 and $80 million a day because of those differentials. And it's not just on oil, it's on gas as well. And the most troubling thing is, though we have been the victims of this foreign funded campaign, most of the damage has been self-inflicted. That no one should be surprised that we have these massive differentials. When we saw the cancellation of Northern Gateway after it had its federal government approval, the cancellation of Energy East, the cancellation of Aurora LNG and Pacific Northwest LNG. These are big, important projects. And right now, Trans Mountain is stuck in a labyrinth of regulatory issues, and we hope that uh, it emerges from it shortly. We have Bill C-69 hanging over the resource economy in Canada. These are challenging times for us, and we need a provincial government that takes the lead and uh, finds us a path through it. Some will say that aren't these regulatory issues federal? Well, the regulatory responsibility for pipelines across provincial or federal boundaries or LNG facilities that do is federal, but the owners of the resource is the province. The strongest voices in Canada on energy issues is the province, and we need to give a clear mandate to our provincial leaders to take this on and to achieve success on behalf of our, our, our province. The second recommendation or area of recommendations that we put forward is on the regulatory system. That right now in Alberta, we operate one of the world's most complex regulatory system. One that is challenged by process inefficiencies and lengthy approval timelines. Did you know that it takes four times longer to approve a well in Alberta than it does in Texas or in Oklahoma? You know, that's trivia to us. Like, no, I didn't know that. It, it doesn't seem right. We should do better. But to investors, that's not trivia at all. That's a decision point. And it's a decision point that is increasingly seeing those investments moving to Texas, Oklahoma, and other jurisdictions around the world. That when global capital investment continues to rise and we continue to lose investment, we have to address this issue. Last year in the United States, they saw capital investment grow by almost 9%. Again, last year in Alberta, we saw capital investment decline. As investors turn away from Alberta due to regulatory inefficiency, we lose out on growth opportunities. Albertans lose out on jobs and families suffer. We can't allow this to continue. It's urgent we create an improved regulatory system that's more efficient, more timely, more certain, and enables growth. The third leg, or the third group of recommendations, is on economic conditions. Here in Alberta, corporate taxes have climbed 20% since 2015. At a time where our economy was extremely vulnerable, we raised our corporate taxes. Meanwhile, in the US, again, they did just the opposite. They did meaningful tax reform. They sent a clear message to investors that they want more oil and gas investment and jobs. And it's obviously been working. 
We need to fix this, and we need to make other fiscal changes that encourage growth. In our recommendations, we made three. The first is we need our corporate tax rates to get us back to a position of competitiveness. We need to encourage competitive and efficient royalties. And we need to put in place the most competitive municipal taxes on the continent. I'm going to repeat something I said earlier. Our goal should be nothing less than to make Alberta the most attractive place for oil and natural gas investment anywhere. The final piece of recommendations that we put in our platform is around climate policy. As an industry, we are committed to developing Alberta's resources in the most responsible way. We view environmental performance as fundamental to making Alberta's energy the global supplier of choice. That's why our industry has spent billions investing in hundreds of technologies to improve our performance and continually driving down our greenhouse gases per barrel. And it's working. IHS CIRA, a global research firm, brought out a report late last year where they articulated in painstaking detail that Alberta's oil sands has decreased greenhouse gas emissions per barrel by 20% in just the last 10 years. That makes us on par or better than the average barrel refined in North America. And we continue to improve. This is the kind of activity that we need to encourage more of through efficient climate policies. Unfortunately, when we don't achieve efficient policies, it hurts us. It drives away investments, and Albertans lose out on the benefits of growth. And the world loses out on the benefits of access to cleaner, more responsibly produced Albertan oil and natural gas. Getting government climate policies right has a huge impact. Now those are our four recommendations, and, and that's the vision that we think can be achieved if we get those four things right. We think that it's an ambitious plan, an ambitious vision, and it should be. We also think it's achievable, and it must be. But we have to set our North Star correctly if we're going to achieve these goals. And for us as citizens and business leaders, now is not the time to sit back, but the time for action for all of us to support a growth vision for Alberta. Because our political leaders have a responsibility to get our energy future right. Thank you. You seem optimistic about Alberta's future. What needs to be done to get the province back on track? Um, I absolutely am optimistic that you know, we are the best producers of energy in the world. Global demand continues to rise. Um, there's a billion people today that don't have access to electricity. Alberta natural gas should be the fuel that is driving that change. The world will be a better place if it is. Um, but we have to stop the self-inflicted wounds. Um, we have to get uh, the basics right, and uh, that would go through the, the four areas that I identified. Perfect. What do you see as the future of Alberta's energy industry? I think one of continued global leadership. And uh, if we can get the conditions for investment straightened to a, to a place where we're attracting capital uh, and creating jobs, um, one where we can overtake Iraq and uh, China to become the world's fourth largest producer of oil. We can overtake Iran and uh, Qatar to become the world's third largest producer of gas. That, that's impressive. And Canada should, we need to stand tall and be proud of ourselves and how we produce if we want to uh, take that global leadership role the next step. Great. You focused on a number of recommendations to improve, Alberta en improve the Alberta energy industry. How confident are you that incoming government will move forward on these recommendations? Um, uh, I guess I'm quite confident because of the, the concern I hear from Albertans. And uh, all governments operate, uh, they, they campaign on beliefs, they bring out a platform, and then they work to execute it. And, I think we're at that point before an election where all parties are thinking about what they want to put in their platform and how they want to position themselves. Um, I think if we're successful as citizens, 
I'd like to see all parties adopt a very strong pro-investment, pro-energy platform. And, uh, and with that, we give them a mandate to be aggressive and intentional about making the changes needed. Okay. Improving competitiveness for Alberta's energy industry seems to be a reoccurring theme. What is industry doing to improve competitiveness? Yeah, um, great question. And over the last few years, we've obviously seen a lot of that. And uh, we've been in a time of scarcity, a time of where capital is leaving and high grading of projects, uh, implementing technologies, finding lean processes and efficiencies that sometimes are challenging on communities. Uh, right now we see um, curtailment and uh, further rationalization. So it's been a very challenging time, but it's been one where companies have had to look internally on how do we do things the most efficient way possible because that's the only way through this difficult time. Which I think positions us well for if we can get the economic factors right to, uh, to grow from this point of, of efficiency. Perfect. All right, now I'm going to open it up and we're going to take some questions from the floor. So if you guys would like to line up at, there's a mic in the back in the center, and Tim would be happy to take your questions. What are you, CAP, and we going to do to solve our cultural problem, which is oil and gas bad, uh, climate change, and I've read 15 books on climate change. I haven't figured it out yet, and I've read the Nobel laureates on it, okay? Mm -hmm. But you don't shut down an economy over, over a question on climate change. So what are you going to do to win the culture war? Great question. Um, I think part of the reason I am optimistic that we're going to make, uh, make the changes that we need to become an investment attractive jurisdiction is the cultural shift that I'm seeing right now. People are going to rallies today in Alberta, but also across Canada. People that have never been to a rally in their life to support the economy, to support oil and gas, to support pipelines. That's something we didn't see a few years ago. We should have seen it a few years ago and we didn't. Uh, we need to con continue to enable and encourage that. Um, for CAP, I'm going to highlight uh, some of the work we're doing specifically because I would love for everyone here to join on. We started something about five years ago called the Canadian Energy Citizen. And it is a online Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, social media platform, full transparency, funded by CAP and the energy sector that talks about energy issues, being proud of the energy sector and the contributions we make in the world and how the Canadian sector operates. We, have, we do major campaigns around issues like uh, Trans Mountain. We sent the Prime Minister 30,000 letters saying we, we want uh, this pipeline to be approved, we want this pipeline to be built. Ultimately, uh, uh, we're still working through that. Bill C-69, we've sent almost 50,000 letters to the uh, Senate. It is Canada's largest grassroots advocacy organization. It's now bigger than Greenpeace, bigger than Sierra Club, and two to five times more active than any of those uh, um, anti-oil and gas. Uh, is it enough? No. Um, but I'm seeing an upswell of Canadians that are tired of not getting the opportunities for themselves or their children that we should with the resource base, with the technology development, with the capacity to do things right. Um, and I think that part of my purpose of talking to business leaders across the province is to continue that momentum and to encourage you to talk to your staff, talk to your families, talk to you, the organizations that you volunteer in and are committed to in your community um, to, to take nothing for granted. That's really my mantra. Thanks for your question. Okay, so market access, absolutely very important. Which specific project, in your opinion, will help our differential invest? We've seen a lot of band-aids get slapped on market access. Hey, let's increase our rail. Let's do this or that. But which of them, all of the ones that have been proposed, do you see would benefit our differential the most? All of them. Um, Any one. I'm not going to name one. No. And in our platform, and we've got some heat from this, we call for the expedited com completion of Trans Mountain, Keystone XL, Line 3, um, and then three additional pipelines. 
and you take your pick. It could be Northern Gateway, which the federal government canceled and are now trying to put a moratorium to block anyone who wants to build a pipeline off our west coast, uh, north west coast. Uh, Energy East or an, another additional pipeline. But global demand growth and Canada's ability to continue to grow our massive resources to be the supplier of choice should not be limited by if we get Trans Mountain, we're done. That, that would be devastating compared to the opportunity we truly have. Yeah, I agree. You know, Trans Mountain is, is just a temporary solution. Um, five years from now, if that goes through and it's built, we're in the exact same position we are now. Yeah. Um, is, is there not a very strong emphasis on just getting more of our production being used in Canada as well? Would that not help our differential a little bit more than those temporary solutions? So Canadian production today, more of it is refined in Canada than we use a refined product. So we're already a net exporter of refined product. But if we were to refine more of it here, you still need a pipeline and a ship to get it to market. So if you refine a million barrels of crude, you need a million barrels of pipeline capacity either way. Um, maybe slightly less because refined product uh, has less viscosity. But the economics of refining in Canada are bad and they're getting worse. All the issues I put forward that would need to be corrected for the upstream to compete, um, you think that the, the, some of the regulatory issues that we're struggling with, um, as far as a refinery that's looking at should I invest in a refinery in Canada or one close to consumption in India or China, they're going to put it in India and China every day of the week until we get those same issues sorted out. Then we can compete for those two. Yeah, but we've got refineries in Canada not using our oil. They're not refining it. Yep. What, what, do we do, what can we do to change that? Change the culture, as Dan yeah. mentioned. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's remarkable. Um, we don't have pipeline capacity to fuel the refineries in central Canada and Atlantic Canada. So they're bringing in oil from Azerbaijan, Saudi Arabia, Nigeria. Um, and they're bringing it down the Gulf of St. Lawrence, all the way into Quebec City, into, into Ontario. I was in front of the Senate last week, and they were talking about putting a moratorium on the West Coast. And they were saying that, uh, you know, the issues of shipping and safety, which are legitimate issues, uh, we should ship nothing that can't be done safely. But if we can't, if we can't do it safely in the, the uh, West Coast, if the same level of, uh, of concern was put on putting a moratorium in the St. Lawrence, people wouldn't be heating their homes or driving in Ontario and Quebec today. But uh, no one is talking about a moratorium in the uh, St. Lawrence. So with getting our crew to the refineries out east, would that help the Canadian differential better than, let's say, Trans Mountain or some of these others? Um, it would help it. Uh, the Energy East was a million barrel a day, 1.1 million barrel a day project. Um, the ambition I th we articulate in our platform is to grow by more than a million barrels a day in the next 15 years. So yes, but uh, that million barrels a day would, uh, will supply us. But until we get coastal access, we won't get global prices. And uh, if we can get coastal access, meaningful coastal access, uh, all our barrels go up in value, not just the ones that are getting through that pipe to the coast. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa. Lisa Kowalczyk, Executive Director of the Medicine Hatton District Chamber of Commerce. So as with CAP, we've been stark advocates for changes to Bill C-69, but in recent days, we've learned more about Bill C-48. And we haven't yet touched on that. Could you kind of explain the challenges around that, how that dovetails with C69, and what, as citizens and organizations, we can do to make our voices heard on that issue? <laughs> Thank you for that question. So C69 is what we're calling the No More Pipelines Act, or some people have, uh, have called it that. But it also will have far-reaching implications <laughs> into potentially our Canada's offshore exploratory wells and how long it takes to get a license for an exploratory well in the offshore. Um, the federal government has floated the idea of capturing and broadening the scope of their federal reviews 
for in situ. We think that's inappropriate. Um, so that is a very important bill, but C48 is just as problematic. It is a moratorium on shipping from the northern tip of Vancouver Island all the way to the Alaska border. So sterilizing a large portion of Canada's coast, the coast that's closest to China and some of the fastest growing markets in the world. Uh, it was not science-based. Um, it is against several indigenous projects, uh, Eagle Spirit uh, Pipeline being one that has been very strong advocates for, for fighting against the federal government who are trying to impose this on them without appropriately consulting them. Um, and if, it, if it's put in place, uh, we are just limiting our opportunities and forcing us to be more beholden to our one customer, the United States, which has been a great customer. Um, but do we really want to have one customer that we are beholden to? Darren? Uh, thanks for your comments, Tim. Appreciate them. That's great. You can make it your way to Medicine Hat for sure. Uh, wear two hats within the city. Uh, I'm a commercial banker, uh, but also uh, elected official for the city of Medicine Hat. Um, you know, I appreciate you didn't get into the weeds in regards to the political theater unfolding right now across the country. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we're seeing some political underbelly that, uh, in terms of political st strategic alliances as to why maybe the Saudis are bringing their oil across. Um, you know, we're all going to watch with anticipation. Hopefully that gets uh, exposed and, and corrective action taken. But I'm more of a realist in, in terms of what can we do, I guess, locally. And uh, I appreciate the comments you made about uh, municipal role. Mm -hmm. So I want to expand on that. Uh, as a city councillor, obviously we have mandate that we can create policy here. We actually have our own oil and gas company, as you well know. Yep. Um, I guess I'm just wondering for direction from you as to what your suggestions would be in terms of policy, uh, local legislation, anything that we can do. Uh, you know, and what your optics are in terms of, of what we can do to move forward. I, I think that municipalities have strong, powerful voices. You represent the citizens of, uh, of this community that many of them are, are employed with and reliant on the oil and gas industry. And I think Medicine Hat, the fact you own your own oil and gas company, uh, sets you apart from really any other, almost, any other municipality in the country. And uh, having that voice heard is crucially important. And it's funny that some of the American activists have flowed funds into groups like the West Coast Environmental Law Society, which is targeting municipalities uh, on the other side. And Whistler would be the good example of where they, I would say, duped the Whistler Council into sending a letter to the oil and gas industry that was not well-founded, was not even rational, ultimately losing out on a major investor conference in Whistler. So the, the American activists are targeting municipalities to skew the debate on their side. I think uh, having strong municipalities that know our industry so well, um, speaking out and holding, uh, holding opponents accountable is, is crucial. All right, well, thank you everybody for all the questions today. For more information on how CAP is promoting the oil and natural gas uh, industry, please visit voteenergy.ca. Thank you once again, Tim, for your insightful information and for taking time out of your busy schedule to spend the noon hour here with us in Medicine Hat. We appreciate all the hard work that CAP has been doing to promote the oil and gas industry. Thank you to everybody who attended today. It's great to see a full room.